Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the OK Grognard Show. It is Saturday, November 28th, 2020. 10 a.m. ish. Central and beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Well, it's Saturday. And that it means it's a GM Review Day. We're going to kind of take an overlook, overview of uh, Excalibur, the 1981 John Borman movie. Which, uh, I think most gamers are probably pretty familiar with. I just recently watched a, uh, recently watched a documentary, which I posted in the Facebook group about, let me read what I wrote there, I'd been fishing around to find and watch beyond behind the sword in the stone 2013 what i found on amazon was under the name excalibur behind the movie 2020 i think it was a repackaged version of the former but i'm not entirely sure given the apparent ages of the folks being interviewed, and since Nigel Terry passed away in 2015, it seems likely that this was a repackaged form of that previous documentary. Not a lot of revelations in it, but enjoyable nonetheless. I'll let you check it out for yourself. Uh, I'll have a link in the uh, show notes. I have it over on Facebook. I'll have it on YouTube. That um, gives you a link to uh, the IMDB listings for each of them, as well as the... Amazon Prime link to uh, do the documentary, although it's in the BBC Masterpiece section. So if you don't have that premium section of Prime, you won't be able to get to it. Um, if you haven't used that before, you can always grab a seven-day free trial of it, which I did just to uh, check out that documentary and a few other things. I checked out uh, a U. Laurie series, mini-series. Maybe it's going to continue. It's uh, called Roadkill. It's contemporary British political drama of a upper echelon minister who rises even higher. It's, I say it's contemporary, it's visually contemporary, but it doesn't use any real politicians' names, and they aren't meant to be Mirror images, the characters, the main characters are not meant to be mirror images of any particular politicians. Just sort of a generalized view of them. It's more of a... More of an indictment of... Corporate interference in politics. I don't... Uh, get into that a lot online, but if that's an interest of yours, then Roadkill with you, Laura, it's pretty well done. Anyway, Excalibur. So if you haven't seen Excalibur, if you've been living in a cave and are completely unfamiliar with Excalibur, yeah, I shouldn't say that. It could be that you've never 
seen it, but maybe you've heard of it. It's definitely worth checking out. It's uh, based off the Arthurian legends. I will say this, if you try to mimic the story in it, just about every character is going to have to die, so maybe you don't want to do that. Set your player characters up for a fall. Yeah, GM reviews means we're looking at this with an eye toward what we can use in our RPGing. So, uh, being someone who doesn't import stories so much as just flavor and story elements and let the players do what they want, there's a lot here. If you import the stories, you're going to find it incredibly awkward in that, uh, well, first of all, I think just about all of the female carrier characters in Arthurian legend are uh, not well depicted. They're uh, narrowly depicted and, of course, are conflicts in and of themselves rather than being fully fleshed out characters. Uh, Guinevere is obviously the ideal queen who becomes a betrayer and Morgana is the uh, half-sister, half-sister of, of Arthur and, uh, becomes a, a nemesis, a mortal en enemy. So, if you decide that this is a uh, story you're going to bake into your campaign games, you're going to find that uh, there's not a lot of room for female characters. And obviously, it's Western European, so any non-white players you might have might find a lack of inroads into it. It is, uh, as with any mythology or a legend, it is of a time and of a place. And no matter where you grab that sort of material from, you're going to find that it's uh, mainly accessible to individuals that have that background. And it won't, uh, won't carry over very easily. So be careful of that. However... If we keep in mind that D&D &D is often set up in uh, to uh, mimic or mirror Western European medieval tropes, it is a medieval fantasy game after all and is written to that milieu, then we have to assume you know that with your eyes open going in. So what is what is the sort of material you can grab from it? Well, there's a, a feeling to it, if you will. Um, I yanked a quote out of the documentary from Sherry Lungi, if I'm pronouncing that right, who played Guinevere in Excalibur. And she says, is it old-fashioned, given the technology we have now? I think it's old-fashionedness, technologically, is a part of its charm. It's like a hand-painted storybook as opposed to a sort of modern, contemporary sort of storybook. The illustration of it, the visuals of it, match the subject, actually. 
they have a feeling of the like uh, illuminated text of the monks has a, a sort of real hand painted feel to it i think she says <clears throat> maybe not the best quote to grab but it uh i think it captures really the point of why you might want to view this movie for with an eye toward what you can pick up and carry into uh into a game absolutely the first third of the movie and the last quarter of the movie are very dark and very gritty. Before Camelot is founded, well, he's, uh, before he becomes king, before Arthur becomes king, the place is a muck hole. I mean, everybody's fighting all the time. Everybody's constantly warring with one another. There is no doubt that uh, the main populace is eking out a living constantly in fear of their lives. There are knights and battles and sieges happening all around people all the time. Nobody is content with what they have. And there's a lot of bloodshed. And because of this, you have to extrapolate that uh, the hardships upon just normal individuals have to be great. And I think uh, <clears throat> I think it's true that there's a dual directionality to uh, such a situation. It's not a one-way street. Um, when those that have power, military power, whatever, are are uh, constantly at odds with one another, and when that ripples out to the general populace, such that uh, people are being uh, killed or their lives are becoming more dangerous, hardships are increased, because of the constant war and fighting, that bounces back, too. I mean, these are the people that are growing the food and creating the civilization that is meant to spread out from those people in power. And that bounces back. If they can't... If there aren't enough of them because of... uh, death due to war, being conscripted into armies, diseases, and all of the things that go with that. Uh, If there aren't enough people to make enough food for everybody, then that bounces back in the other direction. So it's good to think of the symbiosis of of society and... uh, how it's not just a, uh, uh, doesn't just ripple out. It comes back the other direction as well. So keep that in mind when you're creating a gritty, nasty setting, what effects it has not only on uh, society at large, but back on those in, in power. If they can't get food or if uh, food becomes outrageously expensive, or hard to get, at least, even if they forcefully take what they want. If it's not available, they simply can't get it. So the first third, the first quarter of the movie is pre, pre, uh, pre-sword in the stone. Uh, before he becomes, before he's declared king, even after 
even after he is uh, anointed, having pulled the sword from the stone, then uh, he still needs to convince everybody. And even once he convinces some factions, not everybody's ready to agree with that. So there's still more fighting, and there's still more. So there's a, a lot of gritty combat scenes in this movie. And uh, even if you're watching it for no other reason as a game master to, uh, to watch this, one of the nice things, uh, one of the interesting things from the documentary was, uh, was it Patrick Stewart who discussed? Oh, and it's another interesting thing about the movie you might enjoy is uh, a lot of careers... A lot of careers were started. Helen Mirren, Nigel Terry, uh, Sherry Lungy, um, Gabriel Byrne, Liam Neeson, Patrick Stewart. It's early in Clive Swift's career. Um, there were some people brought in like Nicole Williamson who were fairly well known, at least in theatrical circles. And a bit in the movies. But uh, a large part of this cast were newcomers, were theater individuals who had some career in Irish and British theater and uh, were pulled into, pulled into this movie as one of their earliest experiences making a movie. The uh, thing I was going to mention, though, I think it was Patrick Stewart who said in the documentary that uh, one of the one of the things uh, that John Borman did was keep rolling the cameras as the combats went on and told people to keep keep uh keep fighting so they would have a choreographed sequence of of uh swings and thrusts and parries and whatnot shield blows whatever that they had rehearsed for a uh, given combat and once those were done he'd say, keep going keep going he'd keep them going and then uh you know, this is a, a rather dangerous thing to do. Um, but he would get a, a, a very raw sort of combat. It was almost, it was almost um, stage combat improv in that people knew, people got used to generally what they were supposed to be doing in the actual scene, and then if they continued to roll past the scene, there would be other useful combat. And he could put more into the film. And he obviously did. Clive... Uh, Clive Swift, right? Who plays Hector. Is... Uh, is quoted in the documentary as saying that uh, at one point during a combat scene there were some arrow shafts coming past him very closely. And he went to uh, almost hit his horse because there's a lot of mounted combat in this too, which uh, I, I think there's... Probably a lot more in this than in, in a lot of other movies that try to depict Arthurian legend or or any medieval fantasy or medieval period. There's a lot of mounted combat in this. In any event, some arrows shoot past uh, where his horse is, and he he, um, he mentions it to John Borman. Of course, he doesn't know if this is an accident or whatever, and. Apparently it wasn't, because Borman says, oh, you know, something on the order of, don't worry about it, it's not that dangerous, just get back in there. 
which, you know, if you're a uh, young actor and you're in a one of your earliest movies, suck it up, Buttercup, right? You just kind of uh, you kind of jump back in and do your job at that point. This is um, 1981 it comes out, so this is the late 70s, 1980 maybe, that they're putting this all together, and it's a big budget production, and uh, not a lot in Britain had been done. This is, you know, like big Hollywood production, right? Not a lot had been done over there. They had thought about scouted some locations in Europe and then decided, you know, it's the looks just wrong. It's got to be done in in England. In Britain, I should say. And uh with with not a, with not a lot of other examples, without a lot of other touchdowns. They just, uh, the actors just sucked it up and did what they had to do to help make the film get finished. And very fortunately, everyone survived the process. Um, The middle period of the the movie, they switch at one point when, uh, I think it's the point at which uh, King Arthur and Guinevere actually are wed. The knights there are in the super shiny silver armor. So before that, it's all dull and dingy and blackened. And then at that point, everyone's crisp and clean. And the they made sure that the lighting was a lot better than at that point. And they uh, continue on with that middle third of the movie. With that uh, shiny... Days of Camelot look to it. And it's pretty nice at that point. And, uh, but of course, you know, everything's eventually going to go south, as we know. There we go. The uh, when things fall apart, and of course, if you know Arthurian legend, you know that his uh, top knight and uh, Guinevere, the queen, wind up getting together, and of course, that's the beginning of the end when that transgression happens. So must Camelot fall. And uh, as he falls into a depression and King Arthur no longer cares about the kingdom, it becomes apparent something big has to happen to save everything. And of course, at this point, Merlin has been receding. Merlin, who's been the big advisor and the steerer of uh, events uh, has been receding into the background allowing the age of men to take over but Morgana who is also a is a sorceress who uses magic uh, (laughs) has a son by Arthur even though she is his half sister And uh, between her evil and meddling and then the bringing up her son, raising her son to hate Camelot and then they recruit an array of uh, knights to ride in opposition, huge battles, more pestilence. Well, the search for the Holy Grail happens in that last third because this is going to save the Save the land, save Camelot, save King Arthur. And uh, that whole quest is then depicts once again that the land has been 
becoming ridden, uh, ridden in pestilence and famine and plague and everything is reverting to the kind of chaos that we saw before King Arthur's rise. Well, if you don't know the story, I won't spoil it any further. But it is to say, depending on uh, how pristine or how gritty, or if you want to have uh, both in your campaign setting, then by all means, this movie has examples of a lot of different stuff. Costumes are gorgeous. Uh, Scenes that happen within the castles and at festivals and whatnot are great examples, both in the costuming and the uh, production values and what you'll see in uh, tapestries. And um, they use a lot of natural lighting in this, candles and torches and whatever daylight they can get. They don't use a lot of... uh, movie lighting so it was difficult for them to film but also helps us to see things in a way i think uh, by looking at this movie that seems more natural and might be easier to pick up and describe Um, so all of that i think makes this well worth watching one of my favorite films growing up um growing up happened in 81 so you know i was already in my late teens very late teens but there wasn't a lot you know uh between this and uh, the first conan movie and uh, dragon slayer and a number of others that we should probably bring onto the show at some point Uh, these were the kind of movies that uh, were influential at the time in uh, for anybody who was playing advanced Dungeons and Dragons or running uh, any kind of Dungeons and Dragons games so if you want to get a sense of the period of the gaming period and know what sort of influences there were then this is good for sure definitely watch this As usual, most of what I do on GM Reviews is to recommend things, not to tear things apart. So there's a few things I have uh, reservations about with this or anything. Nevertheless, I say watch it anyway. Keep an open mind. Check it out. As always, get what you can out of it. And then let the chips fall where they may. Well, we're about out of time, so I'm going to say thank you very much. Hey, George. George, is Excalibur something you've not watched before? I want to thank everybody for popping in on the OK Grognard show today. Be sure to get back with us tomorrow at 10 a.m. Oh, George, you definitely need to watch it then. It's a classic. 10 a.m. tomorrow for Rules Retrospective. Not sure what we're going to look at yet. Kind of keeping an open mind. Weekly news and announcements on Monday. Cartography and world building on Tuesday. Campaign discussion on Wednesday. GMing tips on Thursday. Building adventures on Friday. Then back around the horn. More GM reviews next week. If you're catching up with this on YouTube, thank you very much. Please do subscribe to the channel. Give us a thumbs up on any videos that you watch and enjoy. And, uh, you know, feel free to make comments. Constructive criticism is always helpful, as are encouraging words and attaboys and pats on the back. This has been the OK Grognard Show from beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Bye-bye.